The following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, was there really a man named Jesus, or is he just a myth? Oh, he's, he's real. Okay. <laughs> well, I believe you're right on that. Good evening. You're watching Search the Scriptures. And, of course, my partner on the program is Trevor Campbell. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the brethren in Payette. Sure. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, my name is Trevor Campbell. I do preach in Payette. I worship there on Highway 62. There's a, a, the building there on the screen is on the north side of the highway. We're right next to the new Dollar General. Not so new anymore, I guess, but next to Dollar General. So if you're in Marion County, we're very easy to find. And if you'd like to come out and worship with us, we have a 10 o'clock Bible study on Sunday mornings. 10.45 a.m. is worship. And if you'd like to phone me, you can reach me there in the number on the screen, 870-435-2737. Call me there if you have a question for the program or if you just want to call and talk about the Bible. Give me a call there. You folks in Marion County, be sure and be in touch with Trevor. Let him know what your question is. Uh, and uh, sit down and have a Bible study with him. You will be benefited by that. And Trevor likes to do that. Uh, and, of course, go out and worship with the brethren at Pyatt, and you will be benefited. They will be encouraged. If you live around Mountain Home in the Baxter County area, we invite you to the services of the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. Uh, we have our Bible classes at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have our worship assemblies at 11 and 2 on Sunday. We have an assembly and Bible study at 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening and ladies' Bible class, an excellent ladies' Bible class at 7 o'clock, or excuse me, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Now, to get to the Highway 5 South Church of Christ building, you'll turn to the southeast off of the 62-412 bypass, on to Highway 5 going down towards Salesville, uh, and you'll pass a Good Samaritan on the right, then look on the left. And you'll see the sign for the Highway 5 South Church of Christ, one mile to the southeast of the Highway 62-412 bypass on the way to Salesville. Now, if you have questions for me, Keith Sharp, then you can feel free to give me a call at 870-321-5746. Or you can email Keith Sharp at gmail21 at gmail.com. Or you can write to search the scriptures at post office box 263 in Mountain Home 72654. Let us know what your question is. Your questions generate the subject matter on this program. And so we're dependent upon the questions that we receive to have the, the subject matter on the program. Well, Trevor, we have this question we want to answer this evening. How can I know that Christ really came to earth 2,000 years ago? How do I know that he was the Son of God and not just another man or prophet? How do I know he rose from the dead? Well, there's a lot of things to answer there, Trevor, <laughs> so let's see if we can get started on that. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. You know, um, when you look at the Bible, uh, the Bible is one book that you can hold in your hand, but really it's made up of many books. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, it contains a lot of history. It contains also prophecy, and it was written over many, many centuries uh, by various writers, various, various authors. Uh, however, it has one complete message, and that's what's amazing about the Bible. And one of the things that is we see going even back into the ancient days, when the Bible, what we call the Old Testament, uh, was recorded, there are references to the, the Christ coming, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. There are references and prophecies concerning him and what he would do and, and about his behavior and so forth. And Christ came and Jesus fulfilled all of those prophecies. And there were eyewitnesses to the fact that he fulfilled these prophecies. And that's very important. We need eyewitnesses. I never saw George Washington, but I do believe he was the first president. I never saw Abraham Lincoln, but I believe he existed, and I believe he did the things that I've read about in the history books because there were eyewitnesses to those things, and many people saw those things and recorded those things for us. And, and the same would be true about Jesus Christ, but even more so because 
different than George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and these folks was all of these prophecies that it's factual. We know that these things were written long before Jesus Christ came to the earth. And then here he comes and he fulfills all these things and does as the Old Testament said he would do. That's amazing. That can only be done and only be the work of God. And in the New Testament, we have writers, authors, who record the fact that they witnessed and saw this Jesus Christ, and they came to believe that he was the Son of God based on the things that they saw and heard from him. And John is one of those people. Now, John wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which is the lat in the latter portion of the New Testament here. But I want to take a look at some of the things that John says. You know, John is concerned about us believing that there is a Son of God, Jesus Christ, and that he did come to this earth. And that's one of the purposes for his record and why he wrote the things that he wrote. Now, in 1 John chapter 1, notice that he is an eyewitness to this Jesus. It says, that which was from the beginning, in verse 1, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The word of life in the context is Jesus Christ. That's who he's talking about. Well, he got to be with him and touch him, just like, you know, they were, they were friends. They were close friends, in fact. And so not only was John an apostle, but he was a friend to Jesus Christ. Spent a lot of time with him, heard him, saw him. And so he says, I've handled him, I've touched him, I've, saw, I've heard him, and, and all these things. Verse 2, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. All right, and he goes on to talk about the light. Jesus is the light and Jesus is in the light, and there's no darkness in him at all. What the apostles including John, witnessed, was this perfect man. This man who was sinless. This man who showed mercy and kindness to others. And as Peter said, another apostle, Peter said in the book of Acts when he taught the household of Cornelius, he said, Jesus went about doing good. And they saw a sinless individual and a merciful and a kind and loving individual. But they also saw an individual who was offensive. Offensive to those who did not love truth. Jesus practiced truth, he taught truth, he is the word of life, and he's also the light. And this is what the apostles saw in Jesus Christ, as well as many others, not just the apostles. He was witnessed by many people. But look what John also says in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 1, and in verse 14, he says, concerning Jesus, he calls him the word here again, the word of life, the word. He says in verse 14, and the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now John, John dwelt in an area that was very populated. He spent time in the city of Jerusalem, which was a populated city, and during the feast days of the Jews, which John was a Jew, there'd be many, many multitudes of people coming to the city. He doesn't say this about anybody else. He, he, he met all kinds of people just like you and I do and was around all kinds of people and, and saw multitudes of people. But only of this one man who is both God and man, Jesus Christ, does he say, we beheld his glory and it was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. This could only be the Son of God. Later on in the book of John, after he records many events, uh, well, he records some of the events of Jesus Christ. He says there's a lot more that he didn't record. But there's a number of things that John records for us. But in chapter 20, and in verse 30, he says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, that may, excuse me, and believing, you may have life in his name. And so John kind of gives us the purpose for his book, the purpose of writing, is so that you and I, who read these things, and read these, these eyewitness accounts and these testimonies, can come to understand what John came to understand, because he saw it firsthand, that this Jesus is the Son of God. Now, there were many aspects to the, to the question that the individual uh, sent in to us or gave to us. Uh, but how do I know that Christ really came to the earth 2,000 years ago? This book is filled with testimony. This book is also filled with prophecy regarding Christ, and that he can only be the Son of God, and that tr he truly did come there in the first century, and we have eyewitnesses to that fact.
All right, Keith, I'll kick it over to you for now. Okay, and Trevor, there's so much more you could say, I <laughs> yeah. know, and, and, and I appreciate you saying what you did and then letting me talk for a while. I'll supplement what Trevor said. It was a very good discussion of it. Uh, there's various evidences that we have that, first of all, that Jesus actually existed, and then secondly, that He is the Son of God. He's not just a, a, a teacher. He's not just a good teacher. He's not even just a prophet. But he's far more than that. He is the Son of God. It's not enough to confess He's a prophet. We must confess that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, of course, we have, first of all, Trevor mentioned the fulfilled prophecy. Uh, and there's some 300 or so Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in Jesus and in His life. And that could not be accidental. The, the, the odds of that being accidental are just astronomical. And so the, the fulfilled prophecy. But we know about Jesus, and again, Trevor's mentioned this, from the books of the New Testament. That's, there, he's mentioned in some secular writings, but primarily what we know about Jesus, almost entirely what we know about Jesus, is from the books of the New Testament. And there's, there's great evidence that these books were written early on, in fact, written in the first century, because by early in the second century, they were being compiled together. They were simply 27 separate books that in the 2nd and 3rd century were compiled together as one book, the New Testament, and then added to the Old Testament that was written by the Jews to make the 66 books of the Bible. But these were written by independent writers, each acting independently of the other. And so, for example, the lives of Christ, each it written from a different perspective, but not contradicting each other, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, of those four writers, uh, Matthew and John were eyewitnesses of what Jesus did. And, and John gives the miracles that Jesus worked as the proof, and of course that miracle includes that he was raised from the dead. But Jesus seven times said, I am, the seven I am's that are recorded uh, in the book of John, and those seven I am's, are upheld by seven great miracles that Jesus worked. So the book of John is Jesus. These are written. This is John 20, verses 30 and 31, and Trevor's referred to it. Many of the signs, truly, Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John records seven great I am's, the seven great claims that Jesus made, which were brought to, to a, a climax by I, in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's the only way that we have to go to God and be saved. And so he worked seven great miracles. And these were not just sleight of hand tricks. John chapter 11, the entire chapter, is devoted to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. He'd been dead four days. Now that's not a sleight of hand trick. And by the way, the Jews react, the unbelieving Jews, how did they react to that? Uh, they wanted to hide the fact that he'd done that by killing Lazarus and killing Jesus so as to cover up the evidence that Jesus had truly raised a man from the dead who had been dead four days. And, the, and, and his sister said, Lord, don't, don't roll away the, tomb, the door of the tomb because his body stinks. He's already dead long enough that he started to decay enough that his body would be stinking. And so Jesus raised such a man from the dead. The Jews didn't deny it. They just wanted to hide the evidence. And so on and on we could go about the great miracles that Jesus worked. And then we add to that his resurrection from the dead, which the Apostle Paul uses as the climactic proof that he is the Son of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he says, If Jesus declared to be the Son of God with power by the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And so when Jesus was raised from the dead, then that is the absolute undeniable proof that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And the more you examine what happened to Jesus, how he was crucified, placed in the tomb, the guards placed around the tomb, the tomb sealed, and then on the third day the tomb was empty. There's no natural explanation for that. That had to be truly a great miracle, the greatest miracle of all, the resurrection of the Son of God from the dead. But now what about the witnesses of that? 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, the Apostle Paul shows us that the, the witnesses to the resurrection, of the dead, and there were above 500 that saw him at one time, but he lists the, the resurrection appearances that Jesus made. And then he says, and last of all, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8, and last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Paul was the last witness of the raised Lord. And so there are multiple eyewitnesses. Now, some of those eyewitnesses wrote their testimony down for us. And they're in books today, just like you read about the life of George Washington, and that Trevor's referred to, the life of Abraham Lincoln. You read about what Columbus did in coming to the Western world in 1492. And we have eyewitness testimony record for us that those things really happened. There's still uh, books written by people who lived contemporaneously with them. And those books are the eyewitness testimony that those things happened. Nobody doubts that. And we have the books of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, actually, those actually saw the Lord themselves. Ma uh, Mark and Luke perhaps did not see the Lord themselves, but Matthew and John did. And Paul did. And Peter did, and he wrote uh, two of the books of the New Testament. Uh, and James did, and he wrote a book of the New Testament. So we have uh, Jude did, and he wrote a book of the New Testament. So we have those who wrote books of the New Testament that have been brought down to us as eyewitness testimony that they really were witnesses of the raised Lord. They knew that He had been raised from the dead. There's no doubt about that. So there's the absolute proof that he really walked upon this earth as a man, that he's not just a figment of imagination, that he really worked the miracles that are claimed for him, and that he really was raised from the dead on the third day. Those things cannot be explained away. Now, the testimony is recorded by men who gave their lives. Only John perhaps lived, and he was exiled to the island of Patmos. The rest of the men who gave their testimony died for their testimony. They had no ulterior motives to give the testimony that Jesus is the Christ, that He worked the great miracles, that He was raised from the dead. But rather, they were willing to die for the testimony. Now, a man who's willing to die for his testimony is an honest man. He may be honestly mistaken, but he's an honest man. But when you have five different men who were willing to give their lives for the testimony, or to be exiled to a, a lonely a rock of a, an island in the Mediterranean Sea, when they're willing to do that for their testimony, and never to go, turn back, never to, to recant their testimony, right on to the day that they died. Paul, when he wrote 2 Timothy, knew that he was about to die a violent death. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. You talk about that he was being poured out as a drink offering, which was a figure of speech of the bloody nature of the death that he knew he was about to experience, as is recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But Paul cheerfully went to that death to maintain his testimony that he had seen the raised Lord and that the gospel he preached was not of man, but was from Jesus Christ, as it says in Galatians chapter 1. So we have all of this evidence that Jesus is the Christ. Now just one other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, and then I'll turn it back to Trevor. I don't know anybody today that doubts that there was a man named Julius Caesar and that he lived shortly a few years before the time that Jesus Christ was born and he was a great conqueror and, 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 uh, and, and he became a dictator over Rome. Now, I don't know if anybody doubts that. But you know, the writings of Julius Caesar are far worse attested than the books of the New Testament. There's far less proof that a man named Julius Caesar lived than there is there was a man named Jesus Christ. There's far less proof that Julius Caesar was a conqueror, that Julius Caesar became the dictator over Rome. There's far less proof of that than there is that Jesus Christ worked great miracles and that He was raised from the dead on the third day. Why would everybody accept that there was a man named Julius Caesar and that he did the things that is written about him and denied that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, they have ulterior motives 
for denying. It's not that there's not conclusive evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. It's simply that they don't want to accept those things that Jesus teaches and demands of us. Well, Trevor, I'll turn it back to you now. That was good, Keith. You know, um, John the Baptist, John the Immerser, we find mm -hmm. him in the Gospels. And this was a man who testified concerning Jesus Christ. And one of the things I want to point out about John was that in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 26, Matthew says of him that all the people counted him as a prophet. They considered John the Baptist to be a good man, to be a man of truth, and he was out there preaching in the wilderness, and the people believed him, and, they, and they, they had no reason to doubt the things that he taught them. And he was from God. He was sent by God to teach the people. Now that same man testifies concerning Jesus Christ. So if the multitudes, and by the way, the Bible does teach that mul the multitudes went out to John and heard his word and were baptized by him, they heeded the things spoken by him. They thought he was a true prophet, a true man. That same man that all the multitudes trusted also testified concerning Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 1, and beginning in verse 29, it says, The next day John, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. That's the, his existence is before me, he's saying. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So here's the testimony of a man that the multitudes in the first century trusted and believed in, John the Baptist. And he says, this is the Son of God. Now, by the way, you know, we mentioned earlier um, in, in the uh, question, and the question, part of the question was, could Jesus have just been a man or, or a prophet? Well, if he was simply a man or simply a, a prophet, then he was a wicked one because he claimed to be from God, the Father. He claimed to be the Son of God. And not only that, he accepted worship. In fact, there's a text in Matthew chapter 14, specifically in verse 37, verse 33, excuse me, where he allowed himself to be worshipped. And there's more than one instance of that in the Gospels where he allows worship. If he was just a man or just a prophet, then he was certainly a, would have been a wicked one to do so and to claim that he was the Son of God. But I believe he truly is the Son of God, as John the Baptist attests here. There's something else that I think is interesting, and that's in Matthew chapter 27 and Matthew chapter 28. And I'll try to keep it brief as we're getting close on time. But Keith, you brought up earlier the fact that at one point they wanted to kill Lazarus and kill Jesus because Lazarus had been raised from the dead by Jesus, and so the, the, uh, the leaders wanted to, to get rid of that and, and you know, cover that up. Well, there was more than one government co uh, cover-up attempt. In Matthew chapter 27, and in verse 62, it, this is after Jesus had died, it says, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, so the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Jesus is in the tomb now, they know that for a fact, and they've set a guard there. Nobody can get to him, nobody can take him out. Well, an angel comes on the third day and rolls the stone away. And in verse 4 of chapter 28, it says the guards, guards, plural now, shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And when the tomb was revealed, Jesus was not in there. He had, he had risen from the dead. So if you come down to verse 11, it says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. These guys had witnessed an angel coming down, rolling the stone away, the same tomb they'd been guarding for these several days. Jesus isn't in there. He's gone. So there's no way no one could have taken him out. He had risen from the dead. And so when they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. Here's a government cover-up right here. 
saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. All right, so, so what do we have here? A conspiracy, right? They, they've tried to cover this thing up, but the fact remains those guards knew the truth that Jesus had been risen from the dead. So there's proof there. As Keith, you brought up uh, Paul talking about how Jesus was seen by over 500 brethren. There are so many eyewitnesses, even people that didn't want him to be raised from the dead. They could not deny the fact that he'd been raised from the dead. And so they were given money to cover up the whole situation. So yes, there was a man, God and man, Jesus Christ, lived on this earth, died, was buried, but he also rose from the dead. All right, I'll kick it back to you, Keith. Thank you, Trevor. Good, good material, good, good answer. Uh, we have a second question I want to just mention briefly because I don't want to spend much time on the question, but it was given to us, so we'll, we'll try to answer the question. The question is, was Mary, the mother of Jesus, kin to Lazarus? A and Trevor, I'm going to give a brief answer and then see if you want to give something also briefly on that. Uh, Trevor and I, before we recorded this evening, were, were re talking together, and, and we counted some five or six Marys that are listed uh, in, in the New Testament. There may be more than that. And, of course, if you'll read John chapter 11, you'll see that Lazarus had a sister named Mary, also a sister named Martha. Uh, and they're mentioned in other places as well. It appears the three of them lived together. Uh, and so I would say there's no indication whatsoever that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was any kin to, to Lazarus, if, 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 he, if, if she were, it's, it's not made clear at all in the Bible. So I don't see any kinship whatsoever that's mentioned there. Uh, Trevor, go ahead. Yeah, there, there's not much to say. You know, the Bible makes it clear that, you know, John the Baptist was kin to Jesus Christ. But, you know, in John chapter 11, where we have Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, he, it talks of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but there seems to be no you know, immediate family connection, if you will. In fact, Jesus in verse 11 says to his apostles, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. He just refers to him as, as our friend there. Well, if uh, in the question was, was Mary related to Lazarus, Mary the mother of Jesus, well then I mean Jesus was also related to Lazarus in some, some form or fashion, but he just calls him our friend. Uh, the Bible doesn't indicate anything. If they were, they were, but I just don't see any evidence of it uh, to, to make any clear uh, uh, connection there. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's much. all I could say too. Fine, Trevor. I want to return to this matter of Jesus of Nazareth and whether he is can be demonstrated to be the Son of God. And I believe that both Trevor and I have given enough evidence this evening that anyone who's reasonable and honest should believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he actually walked upon this earth as a man, that he was crucified, that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Jesus had an apostle named Thomas. Uh, and this is recorded in John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Uh, and after the other disciples had given their testimony, they had seen Jesus that very day, uh, on the first day of the week, uh, of course, the day that he was raised from the dead. And Thomas said, I won't believe unless I can put my fist in, into the spear printed in his side and my fingers into the nail print in his hands. The next Sunday, the next first day of the week, Jesus appeared to the disciples. And he said, Thomas, put your fist into my, in my side. Put your finger into the nail print in my hand. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, blessed are those who have seen have not seen, excuse me, and yet have believed. You're blessed, though you didn't see the Lord, if you believe on the basis of the testimony. Thank you for watching this evening. Watch next time, please. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654, and your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.